Good morning. Happy Easter morning. You know, there's a greeting that is, He is risen, and the response is, He is risen indeed. So let's try that. He is risen. Absolutely. We come today to celebrate. You know, on that, on that, on that morning, it says in Scripture, very early in the morning, on the first day of the week, the women went to the tomb. They went to the tomb to anoint a body, a dead body. But there was no dead body. The tomb was empty. He was alive. So we come to praise the living Savior and to worship him. Let's turn our hymnals to hymn number 289. Christ the Lord is risen today. 289 will stand and sing in triumph. Oh, let me just tell you this. On the third verse, the instruments will be muted more. We will sing strongly on the third verse. And then between the third verse and the fourth verse, there'll be a little four-measure instrumental bar. So we will wait until it comes back in around, and then we'll come back in with the fourth verse. So just wanted to key you in on that. So wait for the fourth verse until after that little instrumental, and we will sing joyously to our Savior. Christ the Lord is risen today. Christ the Lord is risen today, alleluia. Sons of men and angels say, alleluia. Raise your joys and triumphs high, alleluia. Crying ye heavens and earth, reply, Alleluia. Lives again our glorious King, Alleluia. Where old death is now thy sting, Alleluia. For thy once he all does save. Alleluia. Where thy victory, O grave. Alleluia. Love's redeeming work is done. Alleluia. Fought the fight, the battles won. Alleluia. Death in vain forbids him rise. Alleluia. Christ hath opened paradise. Alleluia. Sing we to our God above, Alleluia. Praise eternal as his love, Alleluia. Praise him, all ye heavenly host, Son and Holy Ghost. Alleluia. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated.
a little breather, and then I'm going to have you stand again in just a moment for our scripture reading. What a great day, and how thankful we are that we have the privilege of knowing and loving and serving the risen Savior. Take your Bibles, please. We're turning to Matthew chapter 28. It's a joy to even just to be able to read the narrative let alone to envision all of these things. Matthew chapter 28, we'll be reading the first 10 verses. It's the first book of the New Testament. Matthew 28, beginning with verse 1, reading through the 10th verse. As you find it, I'll invite you to stand with me for the reading of God's holy and precious word. And in the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to see the sepulcher. Behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon it. His countenance was like lightning and his raiment white as snow. And for fear of him, the keepers did shake and became as dead men. And the angel answered and said unto the women, Fear not, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen, as he said. Come, see the place where the Lord lay, and go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead. And behold, he goes before you into Galilee. There shall you see him, lo, I have told you. And they departed quickly from the sepulcher with fear and great joy and did run to bring his disciples' word. And as they went to tell his disciples, behold, Jesus met to them, saying, All hail. And they came and held him by the feet and worshipped him. Then said Jesus unto them, Be not afraid. Go tell my brethren that they go into Galilee, and there shall they see me. Thank you. you may be seated for our time of prayer. Oh God, it's Resurrection Sunday, what a wonderful day. Of course, every time that God's people get together, it's Resurrection Sunday, a celebration of such, because as noted, we know and love and serve the risen Savior. I pray that you would re-impress us with the significance of that. And our people are going to do a good job today in helping us to see the whole story, give us a panoramic view of the life and ministry and death and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. May we be altered because of our being here today. Thank you, God, for your grace and mercy in our lives. Thank you for your showers of blessing. Thank you for caring for us. Thank you for meeting our needs. And thank you ultimately and, and mostly that you are the seeking and saving God and that when we turn from our sin to embrace the one and only Savior, that that's exactly what you do. You save us. You save us all the way through. You save us good, yea, for all of eternity. What a wonderful prospect. I pray that, that no one will leave today apart from that being their personal testimony. Lord, do a great work as we ultimately worship our great God and Savior. I pray this in his matchless name. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. From Gethsemane, the place of his arrest, to Gabbatha, the place of his trial, to Golgotha, the place of his crucifixion and death to the garden tomb, the place of his burial and resurrection. Folks, there is nothing fanciful here. No fairy tales, no novels, only the succinct, true, historically accurate narrative of the Bible put to music. You're about to be blessed and greatly stored. I must tell you without hesitation that there is nothing and no one more important in your and my life than the Lord 
Jesus Christ. It's crucial that you consider him, but not that alone. We must decide regarding him, and, and in the end, everyone does. I would propose to you that if he is all that he claimed to be, and if he is all that he demonstrated to be, then of necessity, you and I have to have a relationship with him. We have to know him. We have to have him. This is kind of interesting to me. I was going to encourage you to sit back in your seat and relax and enjoy. But the events that we're about to rehearse this morning really ought to have us on the edge of our seats. God help us. Walking on the road to Jerusalem, time had come sacrifice again. My two small sons, they walked beside me down the road. The reason that they came was to watch the land.
Daddy, Daddy, what will we see there? There's so much that we don't understand. So I told them of Moses and Father Abraham. Then I said, dear children, watch the land. There will be so many in Jerusalem today. When I reach the city, I knew something must be wrong. There were no joyful worshipers, no joyful worship songs. I stood there with my children in the midst of angry men. And then I heard the crowd cry out, Crucify him! We tried to leave the city, but we could not get away. Forced to play in this drama, a part I did not wish to play. Why upon this day, were men condemned to die? Why were we standing there where soon they would pass by? I looked and said, even now they come. The first one cried for mercy. The people gave him none. The second one was violent. He was arrogant and loud. I still can hear his angry voice screaming at the crowd. And then someone said, there's Jesus. I scarce believed my eyes. A man so badly beaten he barely looked alive. Blood poured from his body, from the thorns upon his brow. Running down the cross, falling to the ground. I watched him as he struggled. I watched him as he fell. The cross came down upon his back. The crowd began to yell. In that moment, I felt such agony. In that moment, I felt such loss. Till a soldier grabbed my arm and screamed, You carry his cross. First I tried to resist him, then his hand reached for his sword. So I knelt and took the cross from the Lord. I placed it on my shoulders and started down the street. The blood that he'd been shedding was running down my cheek. They led us to Golgotha. They drove nails deep in his feet and hands. Yet on the cross I heard him pray, Father, forgive them. Oh, never have I seen such love in any other eyes. And to thy hands I commit my spirit, he prayed. And then he died. I stood there for what seemed like years. I'd lost all sense of time. Until I felt two tiny hands holding tight to mine. 
My children stood there weeping, I heard the oldest say, Father, please forgive us, the lamb ran away. Daddy, Daddy, what have we seen here? There's so much that we don't understand. So I took them in my arms and we turned and faced the cross. Then I said, dear children, watch the land. much about tears as it was triumph for although Christ rode triumphantly into Jerusalem publicly officially and formally offering himself to Israel and actually to the whole wide world for that matter as their king he knew that by week's end he would be rejected such rejection culminating in his crucifixion and, and scourging at Calvary. Just before we contemplate Calvary, I want to note that sinful men of which we all are, and by the way, if I could pause there just for a moment, it's, it's time for you and I to stop arguing with God about such things. Romans 3.23 says that all have sinned and fallen way short of the glory of God. I realize that uh, there may be others who have sinned more than you, but that doesn't negate the fact that you, like me and everyone else, are sinners. We've broken God's law. We've disobeyed. We've displeased. Sinful men didn't just simply say no to Christ, as in thanks but no thanks. We, we rejected him with prejudice. We, we actually sought to do away with him to destroy him. We're like those of old who said we will not have this man rule over us. And so we scourged him. And, and crucified him, putting him to death. But irony of ironies, as sinful men put Christ to death, God's plan for redeeming sinful men was unfolding. Oh, 
They looked at him and saw a simple man, a carpenter with healing in his hands. They saw him calm a sea and heal a dying man. They saw, but could they really understand? They could not, they could not. And though they tried, they could not. He was just a simple carpenter, but with healing in his hands. But could they really understand? They could not. They listened to the teaching that they heard. They wondered at the mystery of his word. They wondered what he meant about a father's plan. They heard, but could they really understand? They could not. They could not, and though they tried, they could not. They listened to the teaching about a father's plan, but could they really understand? They could not. So finally, upon a rugged cross, they killed a man who would not suffer loss. And when at last they took what willingly he gave, he died, but could they keep him in the grave?
One day a plain village woman Driven by love for her lord Recklessly poured out a valuable essence Disregarding the scorn And once it was broken and spilled out The fragrance filled all the room Like a prisoner released from his shackles like a spirit set free from the tomb, broken and spilled out, just for love of you, Jesus, my most precious treasure lavished on thee broken and spilled out and poured at your feet in sweet abandon let me be spilled out and used up for thee lord you were god's precious treasure his loved and his own perfect son sent here to show me the love of the father just for love it was done and though you were perfect and holy you gave up yourself willingly you spared no expense for my pardon you were used up and broken for me broken and spilled out just for love of me jesus God's most precious treasure lavished on me. Broken and spilled out and poured at my feet for me in sweet abandon Lord you were spilled out and poured out for me
broken and spilled out indeed. Christ's crucifixion actually began with the scourging. The prisoner's arms were raised above his head and attached to a post. The Roman legionnaire would approach the prisoner with his with his flagellum, his cat of nine tails, a short-handled whip with short straps on it, attached to it, nine in number, embedded at the end and in the end of each of those straps was, was metal and stone. He would come down on the back and shoulders of the prisoner with all of his force again and again and again, resulting in a, an unrecognizable, pulsating, torn wound. And that was just the beginning. The soldier's job was to take Christ as close to death as possible, but preserve life so that he in turn would suffer through the most ignominious of deaths, and that is death by crucifixion. I mean, literally, nails were driven in his hands, attached to the tree, his feet as well. Blood pouring from his wounds. I think one of the hardest things to watch with such a scene is to observe how difficult it is for the crucified one to breathe. He's hanging. We are very much aware of that. He's hanging by the nails driven through his hands and feet. He's naturally in a slumped position and we're told that you can breathe in in such a position but you can't breathe out you can inhale but you can't exhale and so in your slumped position you breathe in but then you literally have to lift your, your yourself up on the nails that are driven through your hands and feet in order to breathe out and, and child of God you students of the word, you have to see that violent movement and realize that every time that Christ cried from the cross, it was where he was lifting himself up on these nails, breathing in in his slumped position and then literally pushing himself up through the nail in his feet and pulling himself up through the nails in his hand in order to cry, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. It, it, makes, cross Christ, it, it makes Christ's cross cry so much more precious to us. He's shedding his blood. He's shedding the blood for the remission of sins. Hebrews 9.22 says, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. And, and folks, I, I need to note this with you. It's easy for us to have pity on the Lord Jesus Christ. You can't watch a scene like that without feeling sorry for him. But the crucified Christ deserves a lot more from us than that. And I have to warn you that we could pity Christ with all of our hearts and still perish in our sins. You see, and I know this is a simple truth, but I welcome the opportunity to rehearse it with you again today. He didn't just die. He died for me. He didn't just die. He died for you. It was your sin. It was my sin. He had none of his own. This is our substitute. 
what are you going to do with your substitute, the one who actually takes your place and bears the penalty of your sin? How could you ever refuse such love? But alas, that's what he did. It's possible for you and I to view Christ's crucifixion like how we watch an event on the evening news where we're emotionally moved, but in our minds we think this thing is far removed from me and mine. It does not directly impact me. But Calvary is the exact opposite of that. You were there represented by your sin, and so too was I. He didn't just die. He died for me. I love the way Isaiah says it. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. And the chastisement for our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. Folks, this is all about you and me. My sin, not someone else's, oh, all have sinned. But it isn't going to function for us apart from our recognizing as individuals it was my sin, not someone else's. It was sin that is not far removed from me, but rather sin that has and continues to issue out of my very own heart. We are sinners. But praise God, there is a Savior. Christ bore your penalty and mine so that we wouldn't have to. But in the greater scheme of things, what good is a dead Savior? Christ died for us. There's no question about that. He took our place on Calvary's cross. He shed his blood. He is our substitute. He was our substitute. No ifs, ands, or buts. How do we know that God the Father accepted such sacrifice? How do we know that God was appeased? How do we know that the thrice holy God was satisfied. Answer Christ's bodily resurrection from the grave. His empty tomb answers in a most powerful way. Begin to celebrate with us. Do you feel the world is broken? Do you feel the shadows deepen? Do you know that all the dark won't stop the light from getting through? Do you wish that you could make Is all creation groaning? Is a new creation coming? 
is the glory of the Lord to be the light within our midst? Is it good that we remind ourselves of this? Is anyone worthy? Is anyone whole? Is anyone able to break the seal and open the scroll? The Lion of Judah, who conquered the grave. He is David's root and the Lamb who died to ransom the slave. Is he worthy? Is he worthy? Of all blessing and honor and glory, is he worthy of this? Yes. Does the Father truly love us? Does the Spirit move among us? And does Jesus, our Messiah, hold forever those he loves? Does our God intend to dwell again with us? Is anyone worthy? Is anyone whole? Is anyone able to break the seal? open the scroll the lion of judah who conquered the grave he is david's root and the lamb who died to ransom the slave for every people and tribe every nation and tongue he has made us a kingdom and priest to god to reign with his son is he worthy? Is he worthy of all blessing and honor and glory? Is he worthy? Is he worthy? Is he worthy of this? He of faith 
we sang through doubt and fear in the end we'll see that it was worth it when he returns to wipe away our tears there will be a day when all will bow before him there will be a day when death will be no more standing face to face with he who died and rose again holy holy is the lord and on that day we join the resurrection and stand beside the heroes of the faith with one voice a thousand generations sing worthy is the lamb who was slain and on that day we join the resurrection and stand beside the heroes of the faith with one voice a thousand generations sing worthy is the lamb who was slain forever he shall reign Shout the hymn of heaven with angels and the saints. We raise a mighty roar. Glory to our God who gave us life beyond the grave. Holy, holy is the Lord. So let it be today. We shout the hymn of heaven. God. 
does sacrifice work? Does it truly save? The empty tomb testifies a resounding yes. Folks, it is the living Christ who offers to you the forgiveness of sin, no other. It is the living Christ who offers to you the gift of eternal life, the one who himself conquered death. It is the living Christ who offers to you heaven as your eternal home. These things too precious to be earned, only to be received. Christ's bodily resurrection distinguishes true biblical Christianity from any and all of men's religions. For the founders of Judaism, Hinduism, Buddhism, Eastern mysticism, Hare Krishna, Confucianism, Islam, Mormonism, Jehovah's Witness, even Roman Catholicism, all continue to be entombed. Only one died for the sins of the world and subsequently rose from the grave. Only one can truly and eternally save. Listen, Christ has done absolutely everything that needs to be done in order for you and I to be rescued from the penalty and power of our sin. But amazingly, he does not force such on us. It boils down to this. You have to receive it. You and I have to take it. We have to make it our own. John 1.12 says, But as many as received him, to them gave he the power to become the sons and daughters of God. In the end, each one of us is either a receiver or a rejecter. And for those who reject, please know you will spend all of eternity separated from God. The one who created you, the one who loves you, the one who is seeking you, the one who desires to save you. It's called hell. You either embrace your substitute. We are back to your all-important substitute. You either embrace your substitute, allowing Christ to suffer through your hell, or you suffer through it yourself throughout all of eternity. I, I plead with you today to receive Christ. We will give you a quiet moment in just a moment to do that. One quick word to those who are already saved. And I just rehearsed this again this morning. And it's a good wake-up call for God's people. I think we often choose to live our lives not reflecting on what is actually real and true for us. In Ephesians chapter 1, verses 19 and 20, the Apostle Paul impresses upon our hearts that the very power that was used to resurrect Christ from the grave is in you. Absolutely amazing. The very moment that you put personal faith and trust in Christ, the Holy Spirit of God came to permanently tabernacle in your hearts. You and I have resurrection power to live the life that God has called us to live. Think about living the Christian life in resurrection power and ask yourself if that's the way that you, is that the way that I'm choosing to live my life? Would you bow your heads, close your eyes for just a moment? We will do nothing to embarrass you, I can assure you of that. But every head is bowed, every eye is closed. We mentioned to you that we'd give you a moment Perhaps God is tugging on your heart today. You, you have revisited these things. You've seen the Lord Jesus Christ through the pages of Scripture and the music that's been presented. You've been reminded of the blessed gospel good news. The bad news is we all are sinners. The good news is there's a Savior, but only one, only Christ, who took your place. There's only one substitute, folks. It's the Christ who took your place and bore your penalty so that you wouldn't have to. 
But again, I stress he doesn't force this upon us. You and I must receive. We have to receive. We recognize our sin. We turn from it to embrace the one and only Savior. Say, Pastor Tom, how do I do that? The answer, I love it, is a simple, heartfelt prayer. You can do this in the quiet recesses of your heart even now. Oh, you can use your own words, but I offered this to you based upon what we have seen and heard today. You, you can pray this prayer with me, Lord. I've been reminded of you again today. I've been reminded of your life, your substitutionary death on Calvary's cross, your burial and your resurrection. I've been reminded of the fact that you died for me. You bore the penalty of my sins so that I wouldn't have to. And it's you then, the risen Savior, the living Savior that offers to me the forgiveness of sin, the gift of eternal life, heaven as my eternal home. I'm praying to receive that today. I'm praying to receive you, Lord. I'm inviting you into my heart and life as my own personal Savior. And I pray going forward then that you would help me in turn to live for you, Lord, the one who loved me and gave himself for me. Heads are still bowed, eyes are closed. I would love to know if you prayed that prayer this morning. Again, I'll do nothing to embarrass you. I'm simply asking for you to raise your hand. I'll acknowledge that a hand's been raised and you can place it back down. You prayed that prayer this morning and you want me to know. Would you raise your hand just for a moment? Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, sir. Thank you, gentlemen. Anyone else? I can remind you that it's the most important thing in all of life, what you do with Christ. And the fact that in the end, we are either receivers or rejectors. Well, praise, the, praise God for those who are deciding today to receive Christ. And, and know that God's offer of salvation is so very much real for you today. Don't spurn that. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for those who have responded. Again, it's the most important thing in all of life. I pray, God, that the decision would be di driven deep in into their hearts. I, I pray that they would even join us or perhaps other Bible-believing churches that truly are teaching and preaching the word of God, that they, that they would join us and begin to grow in their newfound faith and have the joy of walking with you, Lord, by faith now and then seeing you face to face soon and enjoying and appreciating being a part of the family of God, worshiping our great God and our Savior. Thank you for the great work that you have done. Pray for those who have not raised their hands. I pray, Lord, that you continue to work in their lives. It's still our desire that no one would leave here today apart from knowing Christ, having Christ. And I pray that that would indeed be a reality. Thank you for stirring our hearts today, not only reminding us of the blessed gospel, but the high calling of God on our lives now to live out our lives for this one who loved us and gave himself for us. So as we soon leave this place, God, impress all of these things upon our hearts, I pray for Jesus' sake. Amen.